Welcome back to Nickelodeon. This is Comic Corner, Nickel, classic, classic, known classic. This episode number 2517 and double shot 2411. We have two DC trades from two beautiful women from the Batman Family Comics. Well, first that we have is Batgirl Year One, written by Chuck Dixon and Scott Beatty. Yep, artwork for this book is done by Marcos Martin. The cover art you see for this trade here is Marcus Martin, Andrew Lopez, who is the inker. Um, I have a continuous thing about my rant about the year one stuff. I have no problem with the year one concept. It's just that when I think of like a year, I think of 12, the number 12. This is one of the closest ones I've seen to get to that whole year concept, but it's only nine issues. And for some reason, no company... Uh, I think Dynamite's the only technically did this with Green Hornet because they actually did have a year one miniseries. Let me say for that one. And that was 12 issues. Yes, that was exactly 12 issues. Apparently, they couldn't commit to this particular concept or that. But this book, in a way, does kind of explore Batgirl's first year as, well, Barbara Gordon's first time first year as Batgirl, which, for what I heard chronologically, uh, is set during Batman when he was active for about three years. And Dick Grayson was active for two years. Yep. So, we get basically the famous scene of Barbara Gordon and a dressed up in a Batgirl, well, who basically became a Batgirl costume. Though, for some reason, he used design from the uh, Batman animated series, the um, the New Avengers one. They used that one for some reason for this book, where she battles Killer Moth, obviously, in this book, because he's a D-lister. We also get the backstory of Garfrey Lenz, a.k.a. Firefly in this book. I'm like, that's interesting. Who would have thought we'd get Firefly in this book? Yes. And of course, he's basically treated as the partner of Killer Moth. Yeah, we start with the costume party where Killer Moth comes in and basically helps out. And we see where uh, Jim Gordon basically doesn't like the fact that her, her daughter wants to become a cop, but she wants to become a librarian because that technically is her secret identity. So, if you're familiar with how Barbara Gordon normally is, traditionally written where she basically is a librarian of secret identity and the fact that well she also has martial arts as well and also the fact that she well tried to be Batgirl yeah basically you can say this this limited series takes inspiration from that and of course she takes on Killer Moth then of course basically she apparently uses this thing where it gets like this um authorization from the and she breaks into an op she basically finds out about the JSA yes finds out about the JSA Rips open a a file that's specifically for the JSA. It makes this uses a hand dryer to basically make a copy of this thing. And like the name of the thing, Fox and Gardner. Interesting. I wonder if that's a nod to the creators of the JSA. 1940 Fox Gardner Brownson headquarters. I like that name. They even have like the number here and the surveillance stuff. So yeah, and apparently she runs into Officer Bard. Now, who is Officer Bard? Why Jason Bard? Yes, um, a little strange fun fact when it comes to Jason Bard. For some strange reason, now, Jim Gordon has tried for years to, to basically arrange where he has his daughter hook up with Jason Bard because from his perspective, he probably thinks that Jason Bard, the way it's written anyways, it's like, he wants these two together, not Barbara Gordon, Dick Grayson, or whoever else. He wants Jason Bard. Because he's a former police officer and he wants to keep the police thing. That's kind of how Jim Gordon has written over the years. And this basically kind of hints, doesn't exactly hint that per se, but that's normally what it is. We see her crying for the motif. And her basically in another fight with Killer Moth. And then she runs into Wildcat of all people. Yes, Wildcat. And then we see also a guest appearance here by Dr. Fate. I think this is Kent Nelson in this costume. So, and it seems like basically every issue, like, oh, every time you see Killer Moth, oh, she's, he's basically Batgirl's punching bag. Yep, so. Then we have, like, the costume party, which leads kind of into um, Batgirl's debut, kind of in a way. I mean, he's dressed as a female version of Batman. Of course, he, he thinks that when he first saw the costume, he's like, 
basically, I think that's, that Chuck Dixon tr- is trying his best with this particular book. It just You can think of it as expanding upon that debut, the Millenar debut from the City Comics 369 back, back when it was first released. It's like part of this, part of this miniseries is expanding upon that particular origin story. Which, here's the strange thing. That has been canon for decades. Here, he just expanded upon it. He's not retconning it. He's not undoing anything from that one shot. From that issue for the comics. He's expanding upon it. Which is awesome. Yeah. And then she meets up with Batman and Robin. Yeah. And of course, like, he's, and of course Batgirl easily beats up Robin. And then of course, she, she kind of loses to Batman. And... I like the fact where apparently that she slips out of her costume, gets in the bed, and wakes up. Yeah, and the fact that apparently Jim Gordon is wake wake up his his well his his college daughter. Yep, and Killer Mob apparently goes back to his headquarters where it's been foreclosed on. Yes, foreclosing this damn thing. I have to continue more of it. At the training of herself, then we get, well, we have this wonderful cover image of the giant penny in the Batcave. And, of course, they, of course, Batman and Robin are just watching her. And then, of course, basically, like, they bring us to the Batcave, where we see the Joker card, the giant penny. Oh, and I love the fact we actually have the 1940s Batmobile, which is awesome. I love that. <laughs> I think it was 450s Batmobile. Yeah, then of course, I think as Batman tries to take off her mask, like, who are you? Who am I? Who are you? Yeah, she stops him from taking off her mask. And she does lose the fight, but... Well... Yeah, then we have a guest appearance in this book by the Joker. Yes, well, he's mentioned it was like, no chance against the Joker. Of course, he's mentioning about the Red Hood, which is awesome to say the least. There we go. Yep, so, we have some really cool moments here, and of course, Batman, of course, he, he stands up to her, and of course, he, he'll still he'll, he'll do it despite his objections. It's like, understudy stuff, and then, then, then apparently it's like, Robin sends her a gift. Batgirl, you, you look like a fast study. This up be cram, and trust me, he'll come around. P.S. Pixie boots are optional. <laughs> I thought it was so funny. So he gives her smoke bombs and batarangs. Which, how nice of Robin to do because he's... Well, here's kind of the thing. Robin has fallen for her. Yep. And then we see more... So we'll kill him off basically down his luck in this miniseries. And then we see the stuff with Garth from the Lens because he's obsessed with fire. Yeah, and then he's fired and apparently he sets fire. Yeah. He becomes Killer Moth, like, gnawing at this. Like, uh, Firefly. And he forces Killer Moth to become his partner. Yeah, then we have the Black Canary show up in this miniseries. Yes, Black Canary. Uh, basically, her is here is planning a seeds for the present-day Birds of Prey book, which, of course, Jack Dixon would later write. Actually, wrote basically that in the time this miniseries came out. If you're curious, this miniseries was originally released back in 2003. So yeah, this probably came out just at either just before or after he left to go to uh, CrossGen. We also see Lance Investigations, aka um, Lance. This is actually not Quentin Lance. No, 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 not the character from Arrow. This is the original Lance, the one who is the uh, the hus- the father of the second Black Canary. Yep. And, of course, we have a guest appearance here by Green Arrow. Yes, Green Arrow is in this book. My guess is the reason Chuck Dixon is home this book, because he wrote Green Arrow. But, uh, he actually has been Oliver. Uh, Oliver Queen. He did write, he was actually, uh, first time wrote Green Arrow full-time, is he wrote, Green, he wrote issues of the book that featured Oliver Queen as Green Arrow. And, I've, I've brought this up a few times. The only reason why the Oliver Queen had to die in one because I did ask Chuck Dixon about this, was because of editorial mandate. That was the only reason why he got killed off, so there was that. So, 
this is proven to be an excellent mini series. Like, yeah, rating this is just pure awesomeness. Yeah, and then we have basically where you have Robin with Batgirl after he's like riding a motorcycle. Let's see, where is it here? He helps he helps out a little lady across the street, which is nice. <laughs> it's so funny. Where he's like, oh, please lock me up. Yeah, and of course, uh, apparently the, the artist decided to have a close-up of Batgirl's chest. So I was like, here's Robin helping out with the purse snatcher. And we have a close-up of Batgirl's chest. For reasons. And of course, they hang out for the next issue. And issue number... Eight. So... We need some more bad guys up. Yeah, and of course, like, when I take on the condiment cane, it's like, hey, you're mad. This is background. Maybe you. And then he pulls her for a kiss. He's like, huh? I'm sure he's like, I just kissed a hot girl. And she's like, hmm. I might try that later. <laughs> That's kind of the way her reaction is like, what? Yeah, Robin just kissed her. Yep. That's kind of sparking their, their future relationship they would have. And then we have Blockbuster. No, not Ronald Desmond. His brother, Mark. Yes. They fight him in this issue. And then we come to the finale where basically she she and Rob are, de she and Rob are dealing with Kill Him Off and Firefly. Oh, I love this. Backer pulls out envelope and says, Corner of O'Neill and Adams. Yes, that is a clear nod to Danny O'Neill and Neil Adams. R.I.P. both of them. I only met, I only met Neil. I never met Danny O'Neill. Never. Neil Adams, great guy to me in person. If anybody gets a chance to meet him in comments below, uh, excuse me, let me say this again. Uh, if anybody gets a chance to meet him while he was still alive at a Comic-Con, besides me, Please in the comments below and at, and tell me about your time talking to the guy. Because the guy himself, he is a fantastic guy to talk to. Like like any comic creator, if you have a question, he they will have the answer for it. Providing they have the information. One of my favorite guys to interact with at Comic-Con is Josh Williamson. Because this guy, uh, I love talking to this guy because he and I are about the same age. He's only about five or six older years older than me, but... Um, I chatted about DC Comics, the fact we have, we both are big fans of Chuck Dixon. Um, the fact that he actually didn't know this, but uh, he thought that Connor Hawk, which is a character that Chuck Dixon helped, uh, he, he actually wrote his time as Green Arrow, he mistakenly thought that Chuck Dixon created him. He had no idea that Kelly Pewter created the character. He had no idea about that. Yep. So... Then we have basically like, oh, the future where she apparently has statues of, looks like, um, Poison Ivy, which, yes, you have a counselor hit with him, with her. Uh, Clayface, Catwoman, uh, the Riddler looks like Two-Face, I think. That's Mr. Freeze. And for some reason, Catwoman, the way she's drawn here, it's like she's given the Emma Peel costume before she got it. And then we have the, J the Joker, which... I wonder if Chuck Dixon is teasing Killing Joke here. Yeah, I want... Yeah, and of course she's like, Nah, I'm gonna punch that because... Yeah. Yeah, of course she gives a kiss to Alfred. It's like, thanks, Jeeves. Think that of a... And my is merely a coaching role. I thought she liked me. <laughs> oh, the fire stuff. And of course she tears out a Rupert Thorne thing that we have that Jason my pri pri private eye... And then we have her account to Scarecrow in the miniseries. This miniseries is absolutely fantastic. Love it. Check it out if you're a Batgirl fan. Or, here's another thing. If not only a Batgirl fan, if you're a fan of Chuck Dixon. Uh, if you like Scott Perry, you check this book out. Also, if you're a Batman fan. Because this book is littered with references to Batman lore. Uh, just an absolute really good limited series. I'm going to get this book a 10 out of 10 because it is that good. Oh my gosh, is that good. Uh, next, we have another member of the Batman family. Whose series is becoming very popular uh, in the last year. Which, uh, 
this was limited series, now it's ongoing. Poison Ivy Volume 2, an ethical composition. Yep, and in this very book, it's mostly put basically Poison Ivy still doing what she did before, where we're continuing basically, by the way, this book collects issues, 7 to 12 in our ongoing series. Still remember by Willow Wilson, artwork itself is done by two different artists, uh, Marco Tadira and Alphahan Illy theme. I think it's even that's person. I'm sorry for this pronouncing. And the cover art here, this gorgeous cover art, is done by Jessica Fong. Fantastic. Mostly put is basically her. By the way, whenever Ivy speaks this book, she always speaks in green speech levels. I wonder if basically G. Willow Wilson got the idea of you know doing uh, other color that's non the non white speech levels. I wonder if she got that from uh, Deadpool. I wonder if she did. So he continues the whole thing working for this uh, chemical thing, and of course she deals with Jason Woodrow in these early in these issues here. Yep, and gets a fight with this other woman here, who she deals with pretty quickly, and and of course basically she gets a lot of control, but she tries to cure everybody best she can. And one particular issue after going home, in issue number nine. She goes home, and she spends time at home, like see kids, kids are by, and then Harley Quinn stops by. Now, why is Harley here? So she and Ivy can have sex. That is the only reason why. Smooch and sex. Voila! <laughs> yep. Which, here's the thing. Now, some people... Like myself, do not like where clearly established straight characters are out of this bi get a bit a gay or bisexual. Okay, this is one exception to that rule because this is something that's been hinted at for I'd say for for a long time prior to them basically doing this uh, a couple years ago. But this has been hinted at for the longest time of these two happening for each other now. Ivy, of course, was later added a little bit more as more... She's definitely... Uh, both these two women both confirmed to be bisexual. And they do, in fact, develop that. I'm glad the fact... This is something that... As far as I can tell... I haven't heard anything negative about the whole idea of Ivy and Harley Quinn being a lesbian relationship. I have no issue with that at all. Not really. This is something the fans have wanted to see for the longest time. And... Well... Harley's only here for like this one issue and then she's then she's off. And will she come back? Who knows? Yeah, and also there's this other woman in the book, uh, who becomes a fast food Ivy who she ends up sleeping with her. And then we have this weird scene of basically like these just random women making out with each other, leading to Ivy uh sleep with her. Yep, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, every infected what Ivy's got. So Ivy spends the next couple issues trying to cure everybody, which she does succeed in doing that. Yep, she succeeds. Uh, still has the whole plant problem. She is like, if I ever got affected with it, so she develops a cure, which the cure is developed in the very next issue, issue 12. And yeah, everybody is cured. Ivy is still trying to keep her powers under control. Though uh, Harley Quinn pops up again. And it's like, hi there, gorgeous. Welcome home. Took you long enough. Hey, babe. So I got sidetracked. And the issue ends with them making out. Presumably, probably next issue, these two have sex again. Um, I thought this book was really good. Um, nothing really wrong with this book, per se. Though, here's the thing. Um, and I've spoken about this on a couple of live streams. Where DC has had this really bad habit in the last couple of years... Of hiring writers just to be glad. If they're nominated for an award, hire them right away and make them the main writer of a particular book. G. Willow Wilson uh, is an exception to that because she actually is really good at writing. Yes, she may won a Glad Award, yes. But here's the thing she has success at DC before. Before she did this book, the last book I'm going to say was Wonder Woman. That was actually a really good run. She was in the book about three or four years. And I had no issue with it at all. And when it was announced that she was doing Ivy, like the Poison Ivy ongoing series, I'm like, 
Interesting. I'll check it out. I checked out Love It. Yep. Still love this mini, still love this ongoing series. Yeah, it's still ongoing. Um, I did hear recently that Green Arrow has finally been made an ongoing series now, not a limited series. Thank you for that, because I think DC must have realized that book is selling really well, and it's been received really well, so... Why not make an ongoing? Because people love Green Arrow. And plus, Josh Williams does a good job with it. Yep. So yeah, that's it, particular particular view. Um... I may or may not have time in the video tonight. It depends on my stream. Okay, thanks for you. Bye.